The Johnny Depp Amber Heard saga is not yet over. Amber Heard's legal team has filed a motion to set aside the $10.35 million verdict. They want to dismiss the complaint and they want to look into potentially one of the jurors maybe being an imposter. On this episode of Kiki's Court, we have our favorite legal analyst, Kate Watson Moss, here to help me break down this 43 page motion. Talk about what are the arguments in here that are strong, which arguments are weak, and what does the Johnny and Amber saga look like in the coming days, weeks, months? Let's kiki about it. I keep seeing everyone focusing on this like juror. That they're ignoring stuff like, I, I don't know, I haven't seen anyone comment on the fact that in one of these sections, she's citing Sarah Palin, the Palin case. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's actually pretty interesting, but nobody cares about that. They just care about like, oh, dude, was there a fake juror? Totally. <laughs> There's actually stronger arguments in here that people should be aware of. They had finalized this judgment um, and they, they didn't come to a settlement, basically. Mm -hmm. And so they had like a certain number of days that they can file for this appeal. But in order for Amber to file for this appeal, which I think everyone is expecting, they've said it in interviews, we know that the, the appeal is coming. Um, in order to file for this appeal, she would have to pay the full $10.35 million judgment. Johnny would have to pay his $2 million judgment. Plus there's like $460,000 or $480,000 in interest that she would have to put up in order to file this appeal. So is this motion a way to file the appeal without having to pay that judgment essentially? The reason they had to enter into an order is because what the court, what the jury gave is called a verdict. That is what they ultimately found was uh, who was liable for how much. Under the rules, you cannot appeal until there's a final order on the docket. So what that means, for example, so um, this happens a lot in like the counterclaim claim context where someone will lose all of their counterclaims or lose all their claims and the counterclaims will survive, but the case hasn't gotten to the end because the people who have the other claims, they're still not resolved, so they can't appeal. So that happens pretty often. And the rule that kind of deals with that and says you need to get all the issues in the case resolved um, before you could go to appeal, that's what the order is. So technically she doesn't have to pay. She could put a bond. A lot of times that's what happens. They figure out a payment plan. It's kind of understood although that sort of starts the process of having to pay. Okay. Um, what this is, is a motion to set aside the verdict. So this is a little bit different. Um, it's not the same as an appeal. An appeal is basically saying, hey, either the court got it wrong or there's this new compelling reason why we should, we should be able to win. This is basically saying there were some issues here that it's basically the same issues as an appeal, but it's trying to get it a little bit faster. Um, and there it's, it's very hard to win. They're, they're very unusually won. Okay. Yeah. I mean, obviously we've seen the quote from uh, Ben Chu that was like, you know, we expected this and, you know, obviously it's a much longer motion, but nothing substantive, but I don't know if I necessarily agree with that part of there not being anything substantive. And you're obviously going to tell me if I'm wrong, because again, I'm just a layman that's reading this 43 page document and saying like, okay, well, what does Amber's team see as reason to have this dismissed. And like, obviously the thing that stood up, you know, as like someone who just reads gossip, you know, this like juror number 15, is it an imposter? And obviously right now there's a new series on Netflix, Lincoln Lawyer, and everybody was commenting like, oh, Amber's team was watching Lincoln Lawyer and taking this, you know, this same argument. And of course that's the most salacious part of it because imagine someone gets, you know, summoned for jury duty and then they find out it's Johnny Depp and then they go to serve. Of course, that would be crazy. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think that's just like, it's an administrative thing where it got all wrong, but going through, I mean, there was basically seven different sections that sort of outline their arguments, starting with the first argument, which I think had some really, I thought section one and I thought section five, which was about the no evidence of malice, which to me, two of the strongest sections, but like sort of take us through like, and for me, I still think the first of amendment one, I ignored that one because I still don't think that's really strong. So I've sort of ignored the ones that I don't think are that strong, but you tell me like which ones are, are, are the strongest arguments and you think that could possibly help Amber. Yeah, I think those are really good points. I think 
you're right, the first argument that they made, which was that the damages was not supported. Well, I don't know that the way they set it out are, makes the best argument. I do think that's one of their strongest arguments. So basically, the way I understand that argument is they're arguing that when she got the domestic violence uh, order of protection from the present, that's sort of like the area where Johnny's reputation, the, the time frame where Johnny's reputation was being damaged. What they limited it to in sort of their pretrial motions, they decided that you can't say anything about the Sun article and you can't say anything about the uh, the UK case. And that was sort of a strategic decision that I think Johnny Depp's team made to try and keep that verdict out. Because from reading this, that verdict was very large and made some very damning findings. So they didn't want the jury to see that. Yeah. Um, and by trying to sort of limit the damages period to that time, they kind of were limited in what they, Amber Heard's lawyers are arguing that they were limited about what they could argue, right? So they can't say anything about the domestic violence order of protection. They can't say anything about the sun. And then from that, you have to disentangle all of these negative media stories about Johnny Depp from just the op-ed. Um, and so that to me, I think is pretty powerful because um, the story of how you can sort of tell apart one story from another and what impacts his his ability to find work against another, that's really tricky. And that said, what Amber Heard is asking in this motion is the jury made their decision. So they made they decided they could disentangle that. You're saying they said they could do it, but they were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> that's a really big thing to ask for, especially in the American jury system where we really value juries and we trust them. So saying, no, 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 they got it wrong. Don't listen to them. They they had their reasons, but we don't care what they are. We don't know what they are because we couldn't talk to them. Listen to us instead. It's impossible that they could have found that logically. And that's where it gets a little tricky, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that really stood out to me was this time frame of like, it can only be between, you know, December 18th, 2018, when the op-ed was posted and when the verdict came out November 2nd, 2020, because they don't want to, you know, Johnny's team doesn't want to allow this UK trial verdict in, but yet so much of what we watch seemed to be about what was happening around that. So it was like, almost like Amber's team was handcuffed by not being able to talk about it, but yet Johnny's team was able to introduce it. So that's really interesting. Um, and like, what stood out to me was also was the, the first statement about how they're, he's trying this domestic violence case, which he had settled. And we're it's almost like we've forgotten this is a defamation trial, this Virginia suit, right? Because, you know, as you watched it, is this like any defamation suit you've ever watched? Because I think everyone in their head saw this as a domestic violence case. The thing that's really interesting about this case is that usually it's the person who was allegedly defamed coming in and saying, I was defamed. And the person on the other side saying, I wasn't defaming you. Here, we've got the person saying, not only was I not defaming you, but by you saying the opposite, you were defaming me. So that also gets to another one of the, the argument that the ruling was inconsistent. I mean, it's like, it's very confusing. Yeah, no, you... You brought this up the day of the of the verdict because you were like, wow, Amber ended up getting one of her statements. You know, I wonder how that doesn't conflict. And I remember you sort of explained why you didn't. I mean, reading through it, I, I can sort of see both sides. But like, do you, like, but what do you you know, how, how would you explain it to someone is why it does or doesn't conflict? Yeah. So it's really interesting. And I think it's actually a little bit um sneaky what they do in, in this brief because if you look at the statement that she did win on the Waldman statement involved um allegations that her and her friends uh called the police and then roughed the place up do you remember it was like yeah kind of they roughed it up there was this like preconceived plan to plant like broken bottles so it was expanded beyond just the statement of she you know I didn't she says that I abused her and I didn't um, and so I think that's where the nuance is, but none of that is mentioned in the brief. So if you look at the brief, if I were arguing these two statements are incompatible, it seems like what you'd want to do is show each statements next to each other, right? Yeah. And they don't do that because I think if you look at the statements next to each other, it shows you like, oh yeah, they're not as inconsistent as you would think. Um, 
And they didn't do that. If I were responding to this brief, I would do that. Say like, look, read them yourself. Yeah. I mean, I, you know that they're consistent. <laughs> I thought it was interesting that they put her statement in the footnote. You know, I thought it was like happy because I was like looking, I was like, where's the statement? Oh, in the footnote. And, you know, I think there's a reason for why they did that for sure. Um, yeah. You know, so yeah, so section one was really strong. I mean, they went through, again, it really just dug into like why he can't get damages because he kind of went beyond the scope that he said he wasn't going to go beyond. Um, which, you know, again, I think was one of the strongest ones. We talked about sort of like how the complaint and the counterclaim, they're sort of inconsistent. Again, the third reason, First Amendment, I, again, I skipped over that because I just have this, we, I think we in this country use First Amendment for a lot of things, and I just don't know if it always applies. So I did, for me, I don't know if you agree, I didn't think that the First Amendment was a very strong argument. Well, as a first, as an as a def defamation lawyer and a First Amendment lawyer, I think it's very interesting. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and I, I think it's also relevant to the public discussion because when I've seen people attacking what attacking the verdict basically and saying this is bad for America, what they're saying is domestic violence victims can say the truth, can say that they are they can identify as a domestic violence victim and then be sued under the concept of defamation by implication. So what they're pushing for in this case, in this argument here, is that if there, if three circumstances are met, if the statements are true on their face, if the plaintiff is a public figure, and if the subject matter is one of public concern, then you can have no defamation by implication at all. You have, you only have defamation by false statement. And I think that's kind of a tricky uh for me personally i think that is maybe taking the far, the law a little bit too far because it used to be that the sort of the body of defamation law was built on newspaper articles typically or state or letters written to each other back in like the early 1900s yeah now everyone is publishing things on youtube videos online um and there's a lot more nuance and people are a lot more careful so people are not going to say that person is X. What they're going to say is they're going to say there's X, Y, and Z things about a person. I'm not saying that they're X, but if you read those things together, make your own decision. And are we saying that that is somehow less harmful than just calling someone something? I think that's what you're asking here. Um, and the question is, is that something we're comfortable with? Is that something, you know, that we think is, is, is okay under the law? And ultimately, this is something that courts are going to be deciding and not and and not, you know, voters, which is also, you know, a problem in many ways. Yeah, I mean, I just think technology in general played such an important part in this trial because, you know, even just the fact that her retweeting the article became like this she republished it. Now that part did freak me out a little bit because you've talked to me about now that I'm like a public figure that like I might even be held, like people could say stuff about me and because I'm a public figure, it might not be the same. And I love, you know, we are gonna get this defamation proof merch out because, you know, a lot <laughs> of what was also talked about in Johnny and, and the judgment and how it was excessive was because they were saying, look, Johnny had this unflattering image already prior to this. So $10 million, to cover any more unflattering just seems excessive. So it was like that part I argued, but yeah, the part about the retweeting and it being a republication, I think the general person who is, you know, verified on Twitter or whatever might have a little bit concerned about that. Do you agree? I totally agree. And I also think this is another area where they're being a little tricky because the single, pu the the single publication doctrine is a pretty long, it's like a longstanding known doc doctrine under defamation law. It's typically used just for people who want to avoid the statute of limitations, right? So the idea is I say something defamatory about you. You don't sue me within the one year statute of limitations. Someone re retweets it a year later. And then the idea is that, oh, statute of limitations comes back because it was just published again that you measure from the time of publication courts have said no that's not okay the purpose of a statute of limitation is so that you know hey after a year i'm good i'm not going to be sued on this i can like i can rest rest easy so using it for purposes besides that for the purposes of establishing liability i think is like a little bit 
not what the law necessarily attended and different states have interpreted the single publication doctrine differently. But I do think that the general idea that someone completely not involved. So if you retweeted something from, let's say, People Magazine and people with sued from sued on that, you're not the original publisher. You're just yeah. basically spreading something beyond what was originally published. However, if you're republishing an article that you wrote and you're you know, adding commentary or including the headline now, they argue in the brief that when she retweeted a link to the to the store to the op-ed she didn't know that the headline was going to be added she didn't see it well does she not go back and look at her own twitter like that was not very plausible to me yeah but that part i was like the, the that argument i was like we all know this is her first op-ed right you know and like we all know before we publish like make a post on instagram we read reread reread it over and over our own stories we look at it over and over so the fact that she said like, oh, I didn't even see the headline. I didn't pay attention. I was not buying that at all. And that sort of goes back to that same argument that she's making throughout this, that she wasn't the, that she didn't publish the statement, that the headline was written by someone else. But at the same time, and we, and I think we've talked about this before, like when someone reads an article that is, there was an author identified, you know that that's going to be affiliated with the author. And if you, as if someone, you know, publishes something under my name, I've worked with them, I know that they're going to publish it under my name. I can either say, hey, change that headline. I don't like that headline. That headline is not correct. Or I can go on my Twitter account because I'm a, you know, a public person. I've got lots of followers. I'm Amber Heard. And I can say, hey, that headline, I didn't write that headline. I want to clarify. That's what you sort of, the benefit you get as a public person. Um, and that I think is maybe, that's why I think I've always had a hard time with her, like arguing on the, the publication element when there's much stronger arguments out there for her to make. So then it was like the no evidence of malice. And we've talked, I mean, malice came up a lot. And we talked about it a lot during our lives on IG. Okay. Um, and that one to me was very strong. And I, again, I just want your opinion on it, on if, if, if I'm reading this wrong, but it, it did feel like she did believe these things so isn't doesn't that make it not malice yeah so that's really interesting and this is the section where she actually cites sarah palin which i think is kind of interesting yeah because so that's a really this, recent case right <laughs> that's a very recent case this is the palin versus new york times yeah. case. so she argues here that basically the court is conflating actual malice and proof of falsity so discredited testimony of the defendant standing alone does not constitute clear and convincing evidence of actual malice. Rather, the plaintiff must present affirmative evidence that the defendant acted with the requisite state of mind. So basically what that's saying is the defendant here, Amber Heard saying, I believe that what I was saying is true. If that's discredited, which is what they're arguing here, people don't believe her. That's not enough for, for actual malice. So basically the argument that Amber Heard's legal team is making here is just because you didn't believe that Amber Heard was telling the truth, that's not enough to show that she was, you know, saying what she was saying with actual malice. Mm -hmm. And in this instance, because of the nature of what they're alleging, I think that's like the only way you can interpret actual malice, right? She's, if she's actually lying, then of course she said it with actual malice. Yeah. And they are basically trying to argue here, like, just because you didn't believe her, that's that's falsity. That's not actual malice. And I think that just is not, that's ignoring the facts of the case in a way that's not very convincing. And I think that's why people who are very much on Amber's side are having just this real hard time with the UK trial or the UK verdict not being admitted because by that being admitted, it would just say, look, I have proof. They say that 12 of these charges, including sexual violence, was legitimate. And so I could understand like why people who are on her side are like, I don't understand because he was able to argue everything back to 2016, but she wasn't. So I could, I could see how that would be frustrating for her, for her team. Amber Heard's team must believe that that, that verdict, that, you know, the finding from the UK court just must be so compelling and so intense that there's like no other way that they could have, the jury could have decided if they had seen it. 
Well, that's the other big thing about the UK trial is it wasn't a jury verdict. It was only right. a judge who made the decision. And it was like a 129 page, you know, write up that, that that this judge did. So I think that's another, you know, they say that the jury in this instance was, you know, un, you know, influenced by these outside factors, um, you know, who knows? But I mean, I think that's that's the biggest discrepancy is like you have a judge versus. But when it comes to this motion, in this case, the judge is going to be the only one ruling on this motion. So it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see what her perspective will be. That's absolutely true. And I think that goes just down down to it. Like, no matter who the fact finder is, the fact finder has a universe of evidence and that's what they're stuck on. And for the judge to come in and say like, oh yeah, the jury, they had this you know body of evidence and they weighed everything. They spent a lot of time doing it. I'm just going to say, no, no, never mind. <laughs> We're going to. And the, the thing that's also interesting too is for a lot of these issues that Amber Heard is raising here, the the result is not to just turn turn it over to the other side and say, oh, oh, you're right, Johnny loses, Amber wins. It's to have a whole new trial. <laughs> yeah. Which is in like that would just be insane. Insane. I, insane. I, I cannot imagine any court saying, okay, yeah cool, let's do it all again. Um, <laughs> I mean, sure, that's happened I'm, in, in some instances, but it's very, very rare. And it's usually for some pretty big issues. And these issues are just sort of like, are, the argument came out on the wrong side. Like we argued everything we could and just came out on the wrong side. And uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm like, not going to do another six weeks. <laughs> Now, section six was one of those sections that sort of like, you know, went over my head, you know, you sort of brought up some of the defamation by innuendo, but just in reading it, sort of like what I gathered was it wasn't very strong only because they talk about how the reader, like a, a, a reader couldn't, a reasonable reader of this wouldn't think that this title, because the statement, the title headline of the article um, was one of the defamation statements, would not think it was about Johnny. And I was like, you're crazy because we all know it was about Johnny. I think that is the one thing that no matter what side you are on, we can all agree we knew this was about Johnny. And it was brought up in the trial that this was about Johnny. Yeah, I thought that was basically the way I interpreted this section was they were trying to make some very specific legal arguments about what and what could and couldn't be considered when they were when the jury was determining whether or not there was defamation by innuendo, they call it, which is just a way to make implication sound less legitimate. <laughs> um, but I think you're right. The question is, like, regardless of how you want to frame the time frame and what could be considered, what couldn't be considered, whether or not sexual violence in the title was impl implying that Johnny Depp engaged in sexual violence. I mean, it's all kind of like, well, what does a reasonable person relatively knowledgeable about cultural affairs and things going on in Hollywood, what do they see and what do they think when they read the, the op-ed? And I think this argument around the facts of, you know, the language used and um, the title and all these sort of ticky tacky legal arguments, they just ignore the fact that what people read is what, what they believe. And if you look at, social media, if you look at comments on the article, if you look at comments on Twitter, people were saying, we're interpreting it the way that Johnny Depp's team is saying that they interpreted it. And again, I think this kind of argument versus the arguments about causation and damages and, you know, a libel proof defendant, focus on the stuff that's actually like helpful. At this point, when they already know that Amber Heard is having such a tough time in the media, throwing these ticky tacky kind of not really substantively engaging arguments at the wall it just makes her look like desperate and like come on like you're not admitting when when your your cards are bad like stop yeah. bluffing your cards are bad yeah totally Play your good hands. yeah and yeah. yeah and if you go through obviously this document it's like one through seven it's like seven is like the worst. So like we get to obviously can you know, they want to conduct an investigation into this juror 15 um because essentially whatever is on this juror juror panel list 
It had juror 15 listed with a birth date of 1945. That juror obviously looked much younger than that. And, and public records show that this juror was born in 1970. So they want to just make sure. And, and how could that get through? Because when you have to go to jury, you have to provide proof of either a voter registration card or a Virginia ID. So they're just saying like, was due process protected because, you know, and obviously I think we're going to get to that really quickly that juror, they're just going to say that was an administrative error. There was a typo or something and we're going right. to figure it out. And cause I just, I can't imagine. I mean, can you imagine though what, how great, I mean, great for us as like a TV show. Cause again, if, for us, if that really did happen, if someone did sneak onto the jury, it'd be the greatest thing ever. It's so unlikely. It's so unlikely. Well, and on top of that too, the whole process, you're right. You go, you show up to jury duty, you have to show an ID. And then on top of that, you get these forms that tell you like all about your juror demographics. You'd be insane if you thought that both sides were not then going and doing insane research about these people. Not only that, then they get in the courtroom with them and they voir dire them. They ask them questions. So at that point, you've asked them questions. You you have the date in front of you. You either didn't notice or you didn't care. And like at this point, it's like you had your opportunity to ask them questions and figure this out it's a little bit late now to be complaining about this. Um, and like on top of that, to throw this all out based on that, what could be a clerical <laughs> error, that's like a big ask. <laughs> Basically like, all that time and money you spent on litigating this case, we're gonna have to do it again because you know, you made a typo. It even says, in the, and they even add in the footnotes that they acknowledge that like really that this trial could not be thrown out if it was just a clerical error with the juror. So they sort of acknowledge that this is like the weakest of the argument. So, you know, I think we'll get nowhere. Um, okay. So like, as we're wrapping up, so I guess I need to know like one, how long do you think it'll take the judge to rule on this motion? And if you were the judge, like, like what would be your opinions? Well, first I'll say this is, so this is like the, it's called the opening brief. This okay. is the brief that Amber's team filed. Typically within um, a certain amount of time, Johnny's team will be able to respond to it and will respond point by point. Um, and then she'll have the opportunity, usually it's called the rebuttal to kind of like respond to his arguments and say, this is this is why our arguments are still, still right. So that'll probably take about a month, I'd say the briefing. Um, it's it's a pretty long brief, um, but I mean, there's it. It's still kind of like a, a little bit of a messy brief, so I think it probably will require about a month, maybe maybe two months at most. Oh wow! The holidays and the summer and everything, <laughs> <laughs> and then the court, which is another thing. It's always I hate to say this. It's always really annoying when someone files a brief the Friday before <laughs> a long vacation. Fourth of July weekend. Yeah. Holiday weekend. That's just rude. I hate. I've had opposing counsel that does that sometimes. It's just like, oh, couldn't have waited. We couldn't have figured out a briefing schedule for this. It's not going to ruin my weekend. Thank you. Um, but then um, once the court rules on it, the court will probably spend um, a couple, at least probably a couple weeks, maybe a month um, responding to it, I would think. Um, Although, you know, I think this court, this this law, this uh, judge has been very quick to respond to things, knowing about the sort of the public attention on the case. So she's been very timely. Um, it could now that sort of the juror, the orders out there, it's kind of like just for lack of a better word, languishing before they get to the appeal phase. Yeah. It could she could spend a little bit more time with it. Um, she'll want to be very careful in if she's, you know, putting out a memorandum order, which she would, um, yeah. it would be available. So um, she'll take her, she'll take her time with it. Um, it's also right around the time clerks usually switch over, which is like the person who does all the legal research and a lot of the first drafts for courts. Okay. So that um, is also further complicates things. Sometimes things take a little bit longer when the courts, uh, when the clerks switch over. That might change it. Well, I will say this, you know, like, Obviously, I, I live in this TV world, so a lot of these things I wish had happened. Like, part of me sort of wishes that, you know, Johnny had, you know, cleared his name and he said, you know what, that's all I wanted. I don't really want this $10 million, you know, keep the money, you know, because we all know he's going to walk away. He's already filming. He's already in France right now filming, you know, and we knew that was going to happen. Um, now, again, that could be completely biased because you're like, 
dude, he was like, he was cleared of his name. He deserves his money. And yes, you're totally probably right in that respect. Again, I just want to live in this world where it's like everybody gets a little bit of what they want. Um, that didn't happen, which I guess I was a little surprised they didn't come to a settlement. He's like, no, you're going to give me my $10.35 million and that's it. Um, but, you know, I will say that I think that some of the arguments about the excessive amount of $10 million could be taken in consideration just because I do believe that the jury probably did rule on everything from 2016. And if this case was supposed to be about what happened between 2018 and 2020, I don't I don't think I necessarily see $10 million in damages for that period either. So that for sure, I think, at least if it were me, I'd lower that amount. But that's just me. It's very possible they could. So like, as I mentioned, once the final order is in, that's what's appealable. So she's got amount of time before she files um, and it's called notice of appeal from that order. Um, so that'll come probably, it's usually in the 60 day range in state court. So it's probably around 60 days from that order being entered. Um, so anytime between now and filing that order, you know, that notice of appeal, or even like after she starts the appeal process, they could still come to, they could still settle. They could still say, you know, I'll I'll drop my appeal. I won't pursue it anymore. Um, the thing is, if that happens, we will probably never hear about it because as part of that settlement, she will undoubtedly be asked to sign an NDA. Um, and I'm sure she's probably using not just this motion and her appeal, but also there's been talk about how she might be writing a tell-all book because she sees her future um, prospects in Hollywood to be no longer available to her. Well, if she signs an NDA pursuant to the settlement, she's not doing she's not doing a book anymore. Oh wow! Um, so they could she has some leverage there with that. Um, and you know, if he truly does not care about the money and just wants to you know move on with his life without these false statements out there, then maybe that's what he wants. Maybe that's the best outcome here. Um, it, could, it could happen. It could happen. Well. Clearly the Johnny and Amber saga is not over. Um, it may be a while before we talk about it again, and it'll definitely be a while before we read the memoir if that ever comes out. But we do have other uh, cases coming up. We got Brad and Angelina. We got FKA Twigs and Shia LaBeouf. And, uh, oh, we have Johnny's next assault case, maybe unless he decides to settle that uh, before it goes to trial. So we'll see. So we'll definitely see you around again. Thank you so much, Kate. My pleasure. Anytime. <laughs>